Good afternoon, everyone. This is Aisha from Cytel Marketing. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Alan Gupta. Alan is a machine learning specialist at Cytel's Real World Evidence and Advanced Analytics Group. He has a PhD from the University of Toronto, where he has been studying genetics and rare diseases. In the past, he has worked on techniques involving machine learning for coronary artery disease and effect modifications in hepatitis C and metabolic disease. Uh, his current work, though, focuses on the use of Bayesian networks and Markov models for modeling heterogeneity in response to cancer immunotherapy and for long-term survival prediction using clinical trial and real-world data. So I'm going to turn it over to Alin now. Thanks, Aisha, for the uh, introduction. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about machine learning broadly, and then discuss a little bit why transparency is important in machine learning, what it is, both from a, both as a sort of foundational notion in machine learning, but also from a regulatory perspective. And then finally, I'll describe an ongoing project that I've been involved in, where we've used a transparent machine learning method called Bayesian networks for problems in advanced cancer therapy. Just broadly speaking, uh, machine learning is just a set of algorithms and techniques to learn from data, learn patterns and relationships from data, the ways of doing that, as well as a set of criteria for evaluating how well uh, these algorithms have learned from data. And the key challenge is that we want to identify the data generating distribution from, from a limited sample that we have avail available to us. And this, this distribution is usually unobservable. And this is, as, uh, as it people who work in statistics now, this is a very sort of common inference problem in statistics where you're trying to identify aspects of the population from a given sample. So in some sense, there's a lot of overlap between uh, statistics and machine learning, but there are uh, uh, concepts taken from optimization theory and, and, and other kinds of methods that also sort of form a part of machine learning. So just as a sort of an example of, of a problem, so let's say we have two variables here, X and Y, and I've generated some samples, um, which you can hopefully see as these gray circles, which shows the distribution for how Y and X are related to each other. And let's say we want to understand or find out something about this relationship, and we can fit different kinds of models. I'm showing you two here. So this is a linear regression model. Uh, in blue, you can see this linear line of fit. And then I've also, uh, fitted a neural network which can model non-linear non relationships in red. As you can see, the, the neural network thinks that there's this upward curve that models this relationship between y and x better, uh, it seems, than the linear regression model. Um, and the, the, the problem is which model better approximates state of distribution. Let's say we only have this, this sample. How do we figure out which of these is a better model? And one thing that people usually look at is something like the residual mean squared error, where you can figure out you know, how well perhaps something is fitting the data. But you also want to sort of look at something like how interpretable is the model. You know, linear regression, the model has fewer number of parameters than something like a neural network. So perhaps it's more useful just to reason about what's happening with X and Y. And at least in this case, seems like an appropriate um, modeling function for looking at the relationship between X and Y, but if you had a larger number of variables, that um, that observational way of looking at this relationship and what's appropriate for this relationship and what's not um, might be more difficult to do, and that's where machine learning can help a lot. And I think machine learning uh, has become synonymous with prediction tasks, although I think in general, prediction is a, a subset of machine learning. You're really uh, trying to identify patterns and relationships and data that you can then use for things like prediction, but also things like knowledge discovery. You want to find out what this relationship between X and Y is, and what it means, um, whether you can, you can use this for some other purpose outside of prediction. You can also look into anomaly detection. So, um, you know, let's see, let's say you had uh, uh, some data point here. Is that anomalous in some sense? Um, can you figure out what's anomalous and what's not? Also for summarization, so if you had a large number of variables, uh, you might care about sort of squeezing that down into something in two dimensions so a human would be able to analyze that and also for optimal decision making and that's work that's uh, that's some work in uh, reinforcement learning for example that's used in uh, clinical trials or for optimizing dynamic treatment regimens and so on in terms of the potential applications for 
uh, machine learning and clinical research, there really are uh, perhaps an innumerable number of them. Some of them are highlighted here. So we have, uh, you can use machine learning for looking at preclinical data sets like gene expression data sets and genomic data sets for informing things about perhaps adaptive trials or individual level risk prediction of precision medicine. Um, they can be used for uh, informing clinical trial efficacy and adverse events information and looking at planning clinical trials as well. Uh, this is something that Titel is involved in as well. Real world data and evidence from things like electronic health records and medical records and so on. Digital endpoints, you can look at remote diagnostics. And some, of, some of this has been fueled also by development of cloud uh, infrastructure for looking at things like at home clinical trials and point of care testing and so on. There's a huge amount of uh, effort in drug discovery in silico and looking at personalized medicine for how certain variants might inform how a drug responds to a particular person and also health predictions. This is something I'll talk about today, looking at risk assessment, triaging, and so on. In clinical research, machine learning is being widely explored and probably every big pharmaceutical company nowadays has a sort of a real world uh, division or a data science division. But I think in terms of adoption, there's been uh, some questions about the concept of machine learning as a black box, where uh, it's very difficult to understand. It's, it may be very difficult for a clinician, for example, to understand what's happening on the inside, what kinds of trends are being learned uh, by a machine learning model. You can only figure out what, it, your, what input you're providing the model, and what kinds of prediction uh, it's outputting. And these kinds of models are widely used in machine learning. They have a high capacity, they're very flexible, they can represent a lot of nonlinear relationships, but they often have low interpretability because they might have a lot of parameters. Neural, deep neural networks, for example, have millions of parameters. And it's very difficult to figure out what's happening in the inside. And the problems with these kinds of models, especially in sort of high stakes decision-making and healthcare in particular, is that it's difficult to identify what the biases and limitations of these models are. Where does this model fail? for example. It's also very difficult to uh, audit decision-making if you don't understand the internal decision-making process inside of this black box model of how it transport, transforms the output, uh, transforms the input, sorry, into the output in, in the sense of a prediction, even though it might have a high accuracy on the limited amount of data set that you have. They can also be difficult to troubleshoot if you, if you find a mistake, it can be difficult to go back in and look at the inside and try to fix the inside. And it may not engender trust or uh, arouse trust in users and regulators. If you're providing this for clinical decision making or if you're providing this to patients or regulators, they might be interested in figuring out why it's making a particular decision. And they might not, be, uh, they might not trust this model as much, which can limit its uh, adoption. Now, transparency is really important in general but it's very important in clinical research. In terms of some regulatory guidelines that have come about recently, there's, a, there's the GPDR, uh, the data protection regulations in Europe that uh, when, in which one of the clauses is the individual's right to explanation about automated decisions. For example, if you're making decisions based on machine learning model or some kind of artificial intelligence about, let's say, treatment decisions or hiring decisions, et cetera, then the individual has a right to demand explanation of why that decision was made. And if you don't have a model that, that can explain its decisions, uh, then it can be difficult to go back and see why that particular decision was made. Whereas if you have interpretable models, if you're building transparent models from the ground up, uh, that can be simplified. Now, FDA has some guidance for uh, good machine learning practices, or GMLP as it calls them, um, which describes uh, appropriate validation, transparency, for example, to assure safety and effectiveness in the long run, and focus on validation with clinicians in the loop where necessary. Now, there, there's some research in explainability of machine learning models. So let's say you have built a, a black box model. You can now put a sort of an abstraction or simplification on top of the, the model to try and explain what the model is doing. And this is different from transparent machine learning or interpretable machine learning where you build the, the models to be transparent from the ground up. And as this paper in Nature by Cynthia Rudin, who's a machine learning researcher, sort of urges people to do is to stop explaining the models, these black boxes of how they, of sort of simplifying 
the way that some patterns have been represented on the inside in, in a black box, but use interpretable models instead. And the reason is that there, there have been found, especially recently, that there are some limitations of black boxes when they've been deployed in the wild. One of these is uh, something called adversarial attacks, and this has been commonly found in neural in the neural network literature, but also other kinds of sort of machine learning models. And essentially, I have an example on the right here. Basically, this is for uh, computer vision and image analysis, where you have an image, let's say, uh, that the machine learning classifier can uh, predict is a panda with 57% uh, confidence. But you apply some noise, and this is very uh, well-chosen noise, adversarial noise, that you apply on top of this to transform the image into something else. Now, this transformed image and the initial image would be indistinguishable to a human, but you can fool a machine learning model to predict this transformed image into classifying this as a given with a 99% with confidence. So these kinds of attacks have highlighted uh, the problem with black box models and what kinds of patterns are they really representing? And you could perhaps try to explain what this model is doing, perhaps it has a high accuracy, but it's difficult to understand every single thing on the inside that this model is doing and where it might fail in the future and how you know, this has implications for safety and efficacy in the future as well. IBM Watson for Oncology is perhaps an example of over-promising and under-delivery. It's perhaps the AI on the inside is probably very robust, but perhaps a lot of what was missing in terms of uh, delivery was uh, how would this would integrate into how clinicians work and um, perhaps some of the ways that it was recommending treatments, for example. Now, Compass is uh, something that doesn't have to do with clinical research, but it's a proprietary prediction score for predicting recidivism. And it's used in the US uh, widely, uh, from what I read. It's basically a score that's provided to judges that is a predictor of how well, how likely, uh, a person who has offended or uh, committed a crime is to reoffend in the future. And it's been found, this was published in Science, that random people on the internet with no idea of criminal justice are able to predict recidivism uh, as well as Compass, as this nonlinear model, without some of the biases, the internal biases that Compass has, and also with a fraction of the available information. So, just in conclusion, this part of the talk, I think, from my perspective, especially in clinical research, uh, transparency and in interpretability is foundationally important, not just because we're building models that can affect people's lives, but also because it's important to to take into advice from that that's from clinicians and physicians because there's a substantial amount of domain knowledge that's available to us. And even in sometimes in some cases, we might not have a vast amount of data to work with but we can harness this power that, that's available to us for validation and training of our models and so on. So what I'm going to present today for the rest of the talks is a transparent machine learning model or method called Bayesian networks, which are very flexible as well. And the key idea is that we are performing computations on graphs, specifically on a directed acyclic graph or a DAG, for those who are familiar with that term. Um, essentially, for in the way that we've done it, we start out with some data. Let's say we have five variables, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, we can use optimization techniques and machine learning methods to construct a DAG structure that shows you the relationships between these five variables, A, B, C, D, and E. So in this case, the arrows, for example, would represent the most important relationships or correlations, let's say, um, the most robust correlations in the data set. So for example, A and B are high, highly correlated, and B and D are highly correlated, and so on. Now, there are additional details that I'm not going to go into uh, today, uh, technical details, but this is just sort of an overview of how these work. In industry, and this is particularly done for causal inference and causal estimation, these DAGs can also be derived from um, subject matter experts. So especially when you're working with causal estimation, you can have a team of oncologists or clinicians, for example, come up with a DAG structure by hand, especially when you don't have a lot of data at hand or when you don't have a lot of variables that you need to work with. Th that sort of structure would be a causal structure. So in that case, A directly causes B and B directly causes D. And you can think of A and B as sort of things like hemoglobin and survival and so on. Um, you can also derive these DAGs 
by a combination of data with subject matter expertise in the form of priors, or you can do other kinds of um, incorporations of, of this external knowledge into your model um, after, the, after it's been learned. So, the, so coming up with this DAG structure is the first part of uh, analyzing with or working with Bayesian networks. The second part is usually parameterization. So parameterization really just means putting a number on how these arrows, uh, or what kind of strength these arrows have. So in this case, I'm showing you, let's say, a parameter for node B here, which is, uh, in this case, the probability of B conditioned on its parent, so the node that points to it, which is A. So this is just the conditional probability of B given A. Now, if B and A were discrete variables, you would have this sort of a conditional probability table. But if they were uh, continuous, you could have a sort of a linear regression, a Bayesian linear regression. But you could also have more flexible parameterizations on the inside. So usually, the parameterization is done from data, given some data. But you could also uh, uh, sort of specify these by hand. And now, once you have this parameterized network, you can then perform computations on it, sort of any arbitrary computations. Um, so for example, you could you might want to estimate the probability of E given A and B, or the probability of D and C given B, or something like that. And notice that I haven't specified what an outcome is in this case. I haven't said that E is the outcome of interest, that we're looking at E, let's say, overall survival as the outcome of interest. The Bayesian network doesn't care. We can look at multiple outcomes. We can look at different kinds of predictors. We can choose which uh, variables we want to act as predictors at different times and outcomes at different times. And that's one of the key strengths of Bayesian networks. In terms of applications, so graphical models, which of which Bayesian networks are a subset, uh, are used widely for risk prediction. And there's a there's a risk prediction model for uh, predicting survival with uh, ventricular assist devices that's based on a Bayesian network that's used um, or at least uh, is published. And it, there's a website where you can go look up if you'd like. Uh, graphical models are also used for causal inference. So if you're looking at confounding and you're looking at biases, you can use DAGs and perform some kind of computations using a causal DAG. They're also highly used in Bayesian inference, where you specify a usually a DAG uh, that represents how random variables are connected to each other, and then you use some kind of um, algorithm or you know, something like Monte Carlo, for example, to estimate the various parameters and do various computations on that graph. Graphical models are also used in computer vision and natural language processing. If anyone's familiar with uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, that's a, that's a very widely used NLP model that's used in practice nowadays. And gene networks. And gene networks are nice because you can actually get causal DAGs from data because you can do uh, experiments very easily in genetics and identify uh, a causal DAG from experimental data. Whereas usually you'll just get a uh, an approximation. You'll get an you'll get a DAG that is uh, looks at correlations rather than uh, rather than causation because usually you don't have you only have observational data. You don't have uh, interventional data for the most part. So the use case that I'm going to describe today is for application of Bayesian networks to immunotherapy for advanced cancer. And some of the challenges that are inherent in immunotherapy but also cancer therapies in general, is that there's a high uh, level of individual level heterogeneity in response to treatment. So for example, subsets of patients show a durable response, other patients don't respond to treatment. There are patients who develop severe immune-related adverse events, and there are some patients who do not. Um, and so it's important to understand what kinds of patients would respond to therapy and what kinds of patients do not, uh, to really be able to target uh, immunotherapy drugs to uh, the population that would derive the most benefit from using them. Especially early on during the clinical trial, when trying to make projections in the future and so on, uh, you usually have very short follow-up data and the data is very sparse. And so how do you make long-term projections when you only have this limited follow-up data available to you? And usually there are multiple outcomes of interest as well. So you might want to look at uh, overall survival. You, you might also care about looking at adverse events and progression, response, and so on. And so you don't really want to build a different model for predicting each outcome because you know that all of these outcomes are correlated. They're all uh, linked to each other. So progression impacts how long the person will survive and so on. In this case, 
the there are different uses for machine learning that machine learning could be used for. Uh, and these are all things that I'll talk a little bit about today, most of these things. The first thing could be identifying predictors of response. So identifying what kinds of things affect um, how long a patient uh, lives or how long they respond to therapy and so on. So basically identifying prognostic variables or predictive variables. Uh, you might also care about long-term predictions for health economic evaluations for HTA. So if you're looking at um, how a patient is likely or a set of patients are likely to do for let's say 20 years uh, to lifetime horizon. We think that machine learning can be used for that. It might be a better alternative than the traditional way of curve fitting, just choosing the best sort of curve, the survival curve that fits the data. Because especially if you have survival plateaus or if you have uh, optimistic uh, extrapolations, uh, that can be uh, concerning to regulatory authorities for looking at things like cost effectiveness and so on. They can also be used for informing future future trial design, looking at surrogate endpoints, um, and for patient simulation, especially when you have time varying interventions, you can look at how long a patient is likely to survive, let's say if they didn't have treatment for a certain amount of time, or if they switched treatment at a particular time. What I'm showing you here is the Bayesian network structure, the DAG, that was built using uh, individual patient data set from a randomized clinical trial that was provided to us by the client. We had around 60 variables uh, that were a bit available to us and three outcomes. So we're looking at three outcomes over three time points, so a total of nine outcomes. And we modeled them in a single structure like this. So, so, so the red nodes here, for example, are the outcomes, the nine different outcomes. And there are other nodes that correspond to baseline variables, and then we have some time varying nodes as well here. So this DAG was learned from data from the randomized clinical trial using maximum likelihood estimation, bootstrapping, and model aver averaging. So, so the, the, the widths of the, of the, the weights of the, of the arrows here, the directed edges correspond to how, how much confidence we have that this edge exists. Now, after the model had been learned, we constrained the edge orientation based on causal tiers. So based on external knowledge that, for example, hemoglobin does not affect a person's age, but the reverse is likely to be true. And that, you know, hemoglobin varies by sex, et cetera. And then finally, when we learned the model, we were able to look back at it and say, uh, and assess essentially the, the validity of, of such a recovered model, that a, model a, a model that was data-driven in a sense. So we could go back and ask whether the relationships that the model had discovered made sense. Um, and I'm just showing you three examples here um, where we had uh, the expected relationship where we found a biosynthetic pathway for serum protein A, for example, we were able to find uh, that health-related quality of life scores uh, clustered together and that there was a risk score that was a composite that was based on multiple different uh, other covariates and we found them to be linked together. So this was essentially a way of uh, validating a model uh, visually by comparing it to uh, expected relationships that we uh, expected the model to have discovered uh, if it was working well. Okay, so the first thing we examined in terms of how well the model was doing was looking at classification performance of uh, how well it could predict the nine different outcomes that we'd represented in the model, the, the nine different outcomes of interest essentially, um, using only baseline variables, just for comparison's sake. Uh, so, so for people who haven't seen this kind of a uh, graph before, so this is what's called an ROC curve, which plots the true positive rate uh, against the false positive rate for the classifier against a set of classification thresholds. And a perfect classifier uh, would have a curve that lies on the upper quadrant. So it has a true positive rate of one for all, threshold, for all thresholds and a false positive rate of zero. So essentially we're trying to get as close to that as possible. Uh, this diagonal dashed line represents a random classifier, a classifier that is essentially equivalent to flipping coins. Um, and we compared the classification performance of Bayesian networks against lasso uh, regularized logistic regression support vector machine and random forest, just as a selection of techniques to compare against, to see 
to assess, in some sense, the suitability of Bayesian networks for doing this, especially because the Bayesian network model was constrained in the sense that we had the nine different outcomes in a single model, whereas these other machine learning classifiers were built individually to optimize classification performance for each outcome individually. In terms of the results, we found that the Bayesian networks actually performed on par with all of these other methods, and they kind of performed on par with each other, except for one outcome in which uh, Bayesian networks uh, significantly outperformed. But generally, the classification performance was on par, and this uh, uh, meant that the Bayesian network model, the Bayesian network method for generating a, a prediction model was suitable. Okay, the next thing we looked at, and this is essential if you're uh, publishing this or if, if you're uh, expecting to be th this kind of a model to be used um, by other people is to look at external validation um, to look at how this model performs when you test it on a an external data set that was not available to you uh, to look at generalizability so how generalizable the model is to different kinds of settings and different populations and so on and also to assess the limitations of what kind of subgroups does your model fail on. Um, so we were able to uh, procure a real world data set, in some, in some sense, a gold standard data set for this uh, cancer indication uh, to test our model. Uh, but there's, there's a big problem, uh, which is what do you do about missing covariates? So for example, uh, in the clinical trial data set, we have a rich, selection of features and variables to select from, right? Um, so one of the highest, highly prognostic variables were health-related quality of life scores. As if you'd, if you'd built a model, let's say a logistic regression model with some kind of variable selection, you would have selected for health-related quality of life scores. They would have been one of the variables in let's say the five or six variables that were selected from the 60. Um, but the real world data set did not have this variable. And so you'd be stuck because you can't impute an entire covariate. You, know, you, can, you, you might be able to impute missing values, but you can't do that for an entirely missing variable. The Bayesian network does not care. Um, the Bayesian network essentially performs marginalization over variables that are missing. So it doesn't really care about X is missing or Y is missing. It can basically, uh, it, it basically does what a clinician would do. For example, so so let's say um, the the let's just talk about hemoglobin. If let's say hemoglobin was missing, we could impute or infer from let's say sex and age that the hemoglobin levels for this person are likely to be low. For the human globin for this person is likely to be high, etc. That you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. But a Bayesian effort, because it's capturing these relationships between other variables in different parts of the of the DAG, you can capture these relationships and use them uh, for uh, imputation automatically without having to pre-impute these missing values and missing covariates. Um, in terms of the results, we found that uh, there was real, the real world generalizability of a model was pretty good. So the, the solid red line here represents internal validations across cross-validation on the clinical trial data set. Uh, using all the variables that were uh, available to us. The dashed red line represents uh, cross-validation using only the subset of variables uh, that were common between the real-world data set and the clinical trial. And the, the blue line represents the external, uh, uh, the external um, performance, basically, on the real-world data set. Again, obviously, using the, the common subset of variables. And you can see that those, those two dashed curves line up pretty well, except for those old blip. Um, we also looked at uh, how well the model generalizes by different uh, key subgroups of clinical relevance. So I'm just calling them subgroup A and subgroup B, for example, here. Um, for subgroup A, for example, you can see that the dashed red line and the dashed blue line, which represents the internal performance and the external performance, uh, are pretty close. So in this, for this subgroup, the model has good real-world generalizability, whereas for subgroup B, we see a slight decrease in the uh, ROC or in the area under the ROC curve for external data, for external validation uh, compared to the cross-validation on the RC on the on the clinical trial data set, which suggests to us that at least with this subgroup, the 
the model might not perform as well. And we should probably use this um, real world data set to uh, enhance our model um, and to address these limitations. One of the things that was uh, important to the client was looking at or identifying prognostic variables and whether uh, there were any variables that were differentially prognostic between the two, the two, the two treatment groups. So I'm just calling the treatment uh, A and treatment B here. And these are essentially plots of, of variables uh, that we looked at ordered by uh, increasing prognostic value. On the y-axis, we have the prognostic value. I'm not showing you the units here. Um, prognostic value is computed using a, a, a metric from information theory. Uh, essentially, the, the variables with the highest prognostic value are the most predictive or prognostic of, uh, in this case, survival. Um, so generally, what we found was that variables were generally equally prognostic in, in both treatment groups, except for this one uh, variable that was a, a tumor characteristic that was differentially prognostic in the two treatment groups. So it was much more highly prognostic of survival in treatment group A compared to treatment B. And this will come up later, but uh, essentially this is a nice way of uh, being able to know. And you, you don't have to do this by treatment. You could do this by any arbitrary uh, uh, criterion for stratification. So for example, age or sex or something like that. Um, one of the advantages of working with Bayesian networks is that they're graphical. Uh, that you can have people look at them. And so what I'm showing you here is, this is just a prototype for the, the final thing that we uh, created, but this is a web hosted uh, graphical user interface that uses JavaScript, but uses the Bayesian network model at the back end. And you can basically have the client or anyone who's using the model uh, go in and sort of play around, right? So to look at things like how a particular outcome changes when you change the age of a person um, to, in a sense, see if the model agrees with what they think or how they think it should behave. And that's a really important process, a really important part of sort of vetting the model uh, at different steps of uh, model uh, generation and development and validation. And another thing that we developed was this graphical way of looking at the structure of the DAG to see if the, if the relationships um, could be examined and if they could be vetted by clinicians. And this is also something that could be used in general uh, for um, as a sort of, if, if you're building a clinical decision support tool uh, based on a particular model, uh, this is the same kind of thing you can do. Uh, of course, you'd have to uh, do a lot more sort of UX and UI user interface sort of uh, adjustments to this to make sure this fits well into sort of the uh, um, way that clinicians work. But this is generally uh, a, a very flexible way of sort of working with these kinds of models and providing it uh, to a user uh, at the end. Now, one of the problems with the, the model that I've shown you, <clears throat> excuse me, is that uh, it you couldn't extrapolate from it. You can, uh, uh, so for example, because we trained it on outcomes at three time points, we could not look at what would happen to a person uh, outside of those three, three time points. And that was a severe limitation. Um, we also could not model time varying covariates in our model. And to, uh, so, so, so basically, uh, we extended the Bayesian network methodology to become dynamic uh, by extending the Bayesian network that we developed for time modeling as a Markov model. So here's uh, sort of a, uh, just a summary of what that would look like. So essentially, instead of just a model that predicts um, an outcome at some time point, we have, we specify an initial distribution at the starting distribution, and then we specify sort of a, tr a time replication or a transition uh, model that you can basically unroll in time forward uh, to any time of interest. So you could do extrapolations, for example, to any time time period, really. Um, and this is obviously important for looking at 
uh, health economic modeling, right? So if you're trying to predict at the beginning of a trial how, well, how likely a patient is to survive in the long run, um, you could use this kind of model to build essentially patient trajectory, looking at how this patient will do at certain time points in the future. Um, but obviously the challenges are extrapolation time that's inherently difficult to do. Uh, time varying covariates. So um, obviously we're modeling things like uh, uh, patient characteristics over time, you know, things like hemoglobin levels over time, et cetera. Um, so you might also care about how prognostic changes in variables are. So how prognostic, for example, is a change in hemoglobin uh, on a monthly basis, right? So if the hemoglobin falls really rapidly, we should apply a certain treatment, et cetera. So you can do those, you can ask those kinds of questions with a dynamic Bayesian network. Um, and you can also incorporate time varying interventions to look at, okay, well, if we changed the, the, the um, treatment regimen at some point, how would that affect survival? Or how would that affect hemoglobin levels, let's say? So the first thing we looked at was survival curves. Now the, the, the model is currently a Markov model, uh, essentially uh, meaning that it models a constant uh, hazard, um, uh, which was appropriate for uh, the case that we were working with uh, at the time because we were only looking at uh, survival until about uh, 40 to 50 months. Um, so here's just a sort of a graph of the estimates for survival from the dynamic Bayesian network that we developed, that we extended the, the model that I've shown you to against Kaplan-Meier estimates, comparing essentially the survival probability against time. You can see it matches up pretty well. On the right, I just have a calibration plot which, which um, uh, plots the actual probability of survival against predicted probability of survival. And uh, you can see that the points line up against the diagonal. So the diagonal in this case would be a perfectly calibrated model where the actual probability of survival matches exactly the predicted probability of survival. You can see that the points line up pretty close to the diagonal. So we, we thought the Markov assumption was justified. Next, we looked at prediction performance over time. Um, here, we're only using uh, baseline variables for prediction. And um, we're predicting survival over time. So what I'm plotting here is the area under the RC curve. So uh, an AEC of one, for example, would mean that the model is able to predict or classify survival perfectly, whereas an AEC of 0.5 would mean that the model performs as well as a coin toss. It's basically random guesses. Um, and we found that if you just look at the red lines, for treatment group A and treatment group B, we found that the prediction using just baseline variables for survivals was pretty, well, it was fine, it was, it was fair, right? We started at, at month two after baseline at a, an AUC of around 0.87, which is pretty good. Um, and then it decreased slightly for treatment group A after that and sort of plateaued after month 12. In treatment group B, what was interesting was that the AUC decreased dramatically by month 12, and then it sort of plateaued after that. But the AUCs were much lower for treatment group B compared to treatment group A, um, which indicated that it was much more difficult to predict how a person on treatment group B was likely to survive over time at baseline alone. So there was something happening um, over time for, treatment, for patients in treatment group B that affected that survival in a, in a way that was uh, difficult to predict at baseline. And we were able to identify this variable X that explained that discrepancy between treatment group A and treatment group B, where adding X as a predictor, in addition to baseline variables for treatment group A, and this is using the same model, we're not changing the model, uh, did not affect the classification performance or did not increase it. Uh, significantly for treatment group A, but for treat patients in treatment group B, we were able to uh, dramatically increase the classification performance. And now X is a, is a, is a time varying variable. And um, essentially what this means is that if we, that X, that knowing the status of X for any patient that is given treatment B uh, is much more 
informative about their chances of survival in the long term than using baseline variables alone. So for example, if a patient has poor prognosis at baseline, but they end up with a certain amount of X at some point in the future, then um, that patient who we would have predicted would be uh, uh, more likely to die in the future actually is able to survive better than patients who might have had an otherwise um, uh, higher uh, or a better favorable prognosis at baseline. So X essentially was was a was something that distinguished how patients would respond in the long term uh, between treatment group A and treatment group B. It was a, one of the nice things uh, that be something that's going to be used in the future. One of the nice things was that we identified a plateau in classification performance soon after month 12, um, where uh, there was something that happened in the first 12 months of the clinical trial that affected how a person would respond that could not be captured at baseline. But if we were able to capture those months, the, the trends in those uh, first 12 months, then we might be able to predict in the long term pretty well. Okay, finally, we looked at prognostic value of changes in variables. So what changes in variables, for example, if, if hemoglobin dropped suddenly, was that prognostic of, of uh, survival? or if hemoglobin remained the same, was that prognostic of survival? And this is obviously uh, useful to the client for uh, 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 trial planning in the future and looking at what's prognostic and what uh, what's uh, important to look into. Um, what I'm showing in the left here is essentially all the, what I'm calling univariate state transitions. So, so for example, a, tr a transition between high hemoglobin to high hemoglobin or high to low, and et cetera. For all the all the possible state transitions, uh, for all the variables in the model, um, and we go from variables that are highly associated with death, all the way to variables that are highly associated with survival, and most of the most of the changes are obviously not prognostic, um, or highly prognostic. Um, so we found that biomarker A and B, for example, um, turned out or changes in biomarker uh, biomarkers A and B were most prognostic of survival. I'm showing an example, just a sort of demonstration visually uh, of the changes for biomarker A of um, changes that are associated with survival and changes that are associated with death. You can see that if there's a, a, a change from high to high or uh, medium to high or intermediate to intermediate, that's uh, associated highly with survival, whereas any decrease, uh, particularly for, from high to intermediate, intermediate to low or from high to low is associated with uh, death in these patients. So in terms of future directions, we are looking at lifetime extrapolations instead of just extrapolations to year five from baseline. And for that, um, we're relaxing the Markov assumption of, of a constant hazard because obviously uh, there are patients who uh, will exhibit durable response and the curves will plateau over time probably. Um, so for that, we're incorporating latent variables in our model. Um, and in addition to that, there, we are also adding uh, additional outcomes of interest. So looking at progression-free survival, objective response rate, and treatment-free survival. Um, okay, so just in conclusion for the talk, um, Bayesian networks are transparent and interpretable models uh, that can incorporate uh, external knowledge. Um, as well as learn from data, even if it's sparse data or if, if, if there's missing variables and so on. And, so on. Um, and they can be used for multivariate prediction. So if you're looking at multiple outcomes of interest that are correlated, the, the Bayesian network can adapt to that. Um, and they can also be useful as time models for dynamic processes. So if you're looking at extrapolations, um, the dynamic Bayesian network is uh, extendable into um, modeling different kinds of survival. Um, trajectories and predicting survival uh, in the long term as well. And with that, uh, that's all the data that I wanted to present. I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Alin, for that um, for that presentation. Um, I just want to remind all of our listeners that you can um, still ask questions uh, using the question pane um, at the very bottom. So.
Um, Alain, your first question is about um, sample size and data sets. And the question is for the first case study that you presented, um, how many samples did you need to apply machine learning? And in general, what kinds of data sets would you need to have access to to make the best use of this methodology? Great. So, uh, so Bayesian networks fall under a class of models that uh, perform better when you have small data compared to other kinds of machine learning methods. And these are called generative met methods, which uh, essentially what they do is model a joint distribution. So you don't need large amounts of sample size. They actually perform better than things like logistic regression when you have uh, lower sample sizes. Now, for in terms of the sample size that we used, um, it was a it was a fairly large clinical trial. Um, so so that that I actually made our job a little bit easier. Um, but generally, there are no real restrictions on uh, how much samples sample you need. Uh, sample you need. Uh, uh, obviously, if it affects the the power. In the, in the frequentist world of, of uh, uh, estimation of the model from data. But as long as you have some amount of uh, external knowledge of what the model is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to do, uh, the sample size can be uh, accommodated for. And we can look at uh, uh, computations or um, estimations of the power and so on for, for sample size. But sample size is generally not a big problem for these models because they can work with small sample sizes really well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, someone just wanted a clarification. Um, when you say, um, in general, when you said small data during your presentation, did you mean small sample sizes or a small number of variables or both? Um, so when I'm, uh, right, so when I say small sample size, so, so small data, uh, I mean um, uh, small sample size. We actually had a lot of variables. Um, available to us, and I, I guess more more strictly, the, the it's a um, the number of variables compared to the number of observations. So if you had a lot of essentially, if you have a lot of covariates, if you look uh, have a lot of variables compared to the, the the sample size, that's what I consider small small data. But generally, you can have um, there's there's no real uh, limits of how many covariates you can model. Um, obviously, you have to have some amount of sample size that's uh, that's um, uh, useful. But generally, by small data, I just mean small number of observations and, and not necessarily the number of covariates. Right, thank you. Um, next question. Um, could you say a little bit more about the role of Bayesian networks in population enrichment designs? Um, I'm not familiar with that, so I won't be able to speak to that. Um, I can look it up. Uh, there might have been, there might be some work that's done on it, but I'm not familiar with uh, that concept actually. So feel free to email me, and I'd be able to um, look it up and um, talk about that later. Great, thanks. Um, so the next question has to do with um, missing variables. Um, so the question is, uh, we utilize other variables to impute the missing variable, as you said. Um, but does the missing variable still need to be built into the DAG or not? So for example, with hemoglobin, do we have to include this variable, although the data itself doesn't include it? Uh, OK, so the question is, uh, so, so let's say you started, you built a model where some variables not included, let's say hemoglobin was not a part of the model, and you wanted to test on um, a data set that had that variable, but it wasn't a part of the model, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, you would have to, you could go in and tack on the, the hemoglobin variable in there in some way, but generally uh, that's difficult to do. Um, generally you start out with the, the most um, diverse set of variables that you can get. Um, and then uh, in the future, if you have one of the variables, um, let's say a highly prognostic variable that's missing, then the model can adjust for that. But if you if you want to apply it um, to a data set where the model doesn't have that variable, then you'd have to find a way of including that variable into the model. 
um, before being able to do that. And that, that could be either retraining the model with that variable included or adding it to the model based on some kind of prior knowledge about how the relationships uh, exist in the model and where that variable fits in. Excellent. So the next question is actually about transparency. Um, and the question is, you know, you argued that Bayesian networks increase transparency, but doesn't linear regression also have a lot of transparency? So when would you use Bayesian networks and when linear right. regression? Uh, yes, that's a that's a good question. Uh, linear regression is the foundational model in all of machine learning. So I'm not um, sort of putting down regression models. Uh, uh, so there's some advantages that Bayesian networks have over uh, regression models. Um, one of them being that you can incorporate. So you can think about Bayesian networks as really linear regression in a sense, uh, or Bayesian linear regression in a sense, where, you, where um, it's flexible enough to allow for missingness. So for example, you know you have to build a, a regression model. Uh, let's say if, you, if you're starting with 60 variables, you'd have to build some sort of a variable selection method uh, as a part of your learning procedure for a linear regression where you'd keep only a subset of those variables around. Whereas with a Bayesian network, you're doing essentially the same thing. You're, there's an in, internal form of variable selection in a, in a Bayesian network, but it's flexible enough that if one of those variables that are in a, that would be um, selected in the variable selection process, you know, things like um, quality of life, let's say, uh, that if that was missing, then the Bayesian network would be able to impute that uh, automatically. Uh, whereas with the linear regression model, you couldn't do that. Uh, the second thing is that you can include multiple uh, outcomes uh, that are correlated in the same model, whereas with the linear regression model, you couldn't do that. Um, and you can also choose which variables are outcomes and which ones are not, and which ones act as predictors and sometimes uh, and outcomes at other times. And so it, it gives you more flexibility, but in some sense, the uh, the Bayesian network can be reduced to a, a regression model, if you'd like. There are forms of the of, of Bayesian networks that are essentially identical to regression. So it's a very flexible model that can you can you, you can use it to represent a, uh, a a version of regression that's flexible to missing covariates and missing data, but you can also build more uh, intricate models where you're allowing for uh, uh, um, um, uh, interaction terms, for example, uh, and using uh, machine learning methods to identify those automatically. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how do you address the problem of model overfit? Mm -hmm. uh, so model Overfitting is essentially when you're uh, modeling noise in your data sets. So you're, you're building a model that's too um, complicated. Uh, so in the graph, for example, that I showed you at the beginning, uh, if you have uh, where I was fitting the neural network, you found this curve um, uh, that could be an over that could be an over you could consider that to be overfitting if it wasn't the actual true. Um, relationship between X and Y. So that would be an, uh, an instance of overfitting. With Bayesian networks, we usually use penalized uh, maximum likelihood estimation. So we're using, let's say, um, AIC or BIC if you want a higher penalty for um, model complexity. And essentially, the, the density of the DAG, uh, the number of edges in the DAG, um, relates to how complex the model is. So if you have a sparser uh, DAG, um, uh, and especially if you do some kind of a model averaging technique, which we did using bootstrapping, then you can sort of help counter the, the problems with overfitting and so on. And um, techniques like cross-validation, um, which is used to develop or get results for um, the ROC curves that I showed you, uh, can be used to assess whether your model has overfitted to the data or not. So we were actually working with a tenfold cross validation. We we're looking at ten iterations of tenfold cross validation when we were assessing the classification performance of a model, um, and we think that the model has not overfitted because it doesn't perform poorly in uh, uh, cross validation. 
Excellent. Um, so we have two questions here. Um, the first asks, are there challenges that um, statisticians or companies need to aware of um, in applications of Bayesian networks? And if so, what are they? Uh, so could you repeat the question? Sorry. So um, say you're interested in applying um, Bayesian networks. Um, yeah. What are the challenges that people should be wary of right off the bat, essentially? Okay. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that there is no true model, in a sense, um, based on different criteria, and, based on different criteria for choosing a model and the, the kinds of things that you want to use the model for. There can be different ways of identifying a, a DAG that meets your purpose uh, uh, or addresses a particular problem that a person has. So, for example, uh, usually for when you're looking at prediction tasks, you don't build a causal model, although you can incorporate uh, uh, aspects of causality into your model as we did. And if you were using building a model for estimating causal effects, you would not build a, 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 a DAG from data using machine learning um, exclusively. Um, and so essentially, uh, you have to have some insight into the problem, and then you select a method to, to for training your Bayesian networks based on that, based on that um, problem that you're trying to address. And the nice thing about working in, in the division that I work in, uh, the real world and advanced analytics, is that I have uh, access to an interdisciplinary team where we have health economists and we have uh, clinical researchers and epidemiologists to work on these problems and understand these problems. And so it's easy for me to adapt what I'm working with and work under a framework that's informed by uh, people who know and understand the challenges in these kinds of things. Um, so that's the biggest challenge of the work in Bayesian networks is to be able to adapt the training um, because it's so flexible to a particular problem at hand by understanding what kinds of uh, problems exist and what are the kinds of things the client, for example, wants you to address. Great. So as we have one more question, I'll go ahead and answer it. I appreciate that we're about a minute um, past one. Um, but the question is, you know, a lot of companies are offering um, machine learning. Is the kind of machine learning you do at Cytel um, a standard approach? Are there, is there, are there differentiators? What makes Cytel different? Right. So that's a that's a good question. Um, as I said, uh, uh, Cytel in general, but especially the, uh, the real world and advanced analytics department that I'm part of. Um, has access and has people who work in clinical research primarily. Um, they're all technical people. Um, and so I think this interdisciplinary team, um, which understands some of these challenges, challenges uh, at a deeper level, um, uh, can help balance the fact that we're building models for application to problems uh, in a way that's informed by uh, the problem and not just driven by the models because you can you can develop any kinds of any kind of machine learning model uh, in isolation for any problems but if you if you don't understand at a deeper level what's what the client wants because usually uh, and often a client doesn't really know what they want they have a, a problem and then it's up to you to provide guidance on what's the the best way of addressing this problem and uh, addressing the challenges that you that you're likely to encounter and I think Cytel has that capacity of um, uh, people who understand those problems at a deeper level that can inform model building and validation and also access to a lot of the real world data set that you need for testing and evaluations and informing um, informing these models. Uh, and so I think Cytel has a unique um, strength in that area. Thank you so much, Alind. Um, and thanks to all of our listeners um, for tuning in today. Um, have a great rest of your day.